If you travel southwest towards the glowing sea, you find Vault 95. Vault 95 is swarming with gunners, both inside and out. When you arrive, you have to defeat two Assaultrons and a bunch of gunners stationed on top of the vault. You may reach the vault from behind, which will put you at the top of the catwalk, where you can kill the Assaultrons and the gunners, loot their corpses, and then enter the vault. The vault door appears to be stuck open. Despite having a Pip-Boy, you can't use it to access the controls and close the door. Using an elevator to reach the interior of the vault, you round a corner to face stiff opposition from gunners and machine gun turrets leveled against you. This entryway is the toughest fight of the vault. After the battle comes to a close and you begin to clean up a little bit, you notice that there are chems everywhere. Stimpax, Jet, Psycho, it's all over, and oftentimes you'll find chems lying beside skeletons, some of which are wearing Vault 95 vault suits. Now the corpses are clean skeletons. You don't find any bleeding skeletons of vault dwellers. You don't find any decaying bodies of vault dwellers. So it's clear that these vault dwellers died years ago, long before the gunners ever took up residence inside Vault 95. So that begs the question, how did they die? And what was the purpose of this vault? If you climb up the stairs in the atrium all the way to the top, you find the overseer's room. Inside, you find a circle of aluminum chairs with the skeletons of dead vault dwellers arrayed in a circle. You'll see coffee cups and pots of coffee all over the place, in the overseer's room and throughout the vault. Taking a look at the overseer's terminal will tell you why. From all appearances, Vault 95 appeared to be a legitimate rehabilitation vault where people would voluntarily submit themselves to detox off of harmful chems. Hence the coffee. Everyone knows that people coming off of addictions do love their coffee. Everything seems to be above board. The overseer's name was Jane Myers. Unlike other vaults within the vault Tech family of vaults, this overseer was actually voted to her position by other dwellers of the vault. Other vault seers were appointed to their posts by vault Tech because vault Tech detected some sort of character quality within them that they liked. Think Vault 114. But this vault is different. The overseer's terminal tells us that the residents take a vote once a year on October 30th to find a new overseer for the vault. They choose an overseer by awarding people with merit points. I suppose we can assume that members of the vault did good things or helped each other out throughout the year, and whichever one was the most helpful, the kindest, received the most merit points and became appointed the overseer. Uncharacteristically, Vault Tech tells the Overseer that being the Overseer is not a position of power, but rather a position of support and servitude. They encourage the Overseer to instruct with positive reinforcement and encouragement instead of punitive measures. The Overseer's room then was less a perch for the Overseer to look out over the inhabitants of the Vault and more a group therapy room hence the circle of chairs. The terminal records one meeting between the overseer and other members of the vault where they discussed the goings on in the vault and whether or not they should continue with the program. It's clear that the program was some sort of Alcoholics Anonymous type program designed to get people off of whatever substance they were addicted to. We find the meeting notes for one of these meetings. A man named Randall tries to get everyone to stop with the meetings. He feels that the usefulness of the meetings have run their course. He doesn't feel addicted anymore. He doesn't want to do these meetings anymore. But everyone reminds him that we're all addicts here, and we may pick up our unhealthy habits again if we stop the meetings. The group votes to continue the meetings despite Randall's insistence. This can be seen as a reference to the book and film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where a man named Randall, portrayed by Jack Nicholson, is the lone rebel, constantly trying to get out of meetings and shirk his responsibilities. The dwellers of this vault appear to be happy. vault refers to the residents of Vault 95 as a family. But if they were a family, how did they all die? Clearly something went on here to break that familial bond that tied the residents together so that they fought each other and killed each other. That is the only explanation for their corpses. The date of the meeting notes in the terminal is 2082, five years after the bombs dropped in 2077. 
For five years, these residents were detoxing, trying to get off of drugs and alcohol. We can assume that whatever cataclysmic event happened, happened right after the final meeting notes in the terminal, otherwise it would have been overwritten by later meeting notes. These skeletons then had been here for nearly 200 years, until the gunners discovered the complex and occupied it. Now the reason you, the sole survivor, come to Vault 95 is likely to help Kate in the quest Benign Intervention. When you get Kate as a companion, she is a damaged individual. She was a cage fighter. She had been ravished by raiders and had had a horrible upbringing with her family. She resorted to chems and other substances to dull the pain, but she felt that she was on the verge of death. She heard tale that there was some sort of machine inside Vault 95 that could cure her of her addictions, that could take away her pain. Left of the atrium is the facility's wing terminal. Unlocking that door brings you to the facility's wing that is filled with gunners. After fighting your way through, you come to a staircase which leads you to an upper level where you find the detox facility terminal. Inside the detox facility is a clean room with a chair inside used to help get people off of chem addiction. If you have Kate with you, this is the tool you use to cure her of her addictions. I'm gonna sit in the chair. Whenever you're ready, you go ahead and throw the switch. <clears throat> it doesn't look like a very pleasant procedure. After Kate uses the detox facility and you complete the quest, you now lose affinity if you use chems in front of Kate. She says that after all you've been through together, that's very insensitive. Kate's story is a tragic one, and we don't have time for it here today. We'll cover her story in another video, but for now, let's focus on the history and tragedy of Vault 95. Moving out of the facilities wing back into the atrium, across the atrium you find the residential wing to the vault. You can unlock the door that leads to this wing from the overseer's terminal. The residential wing is guarded by even more gunners, and in one of the wrecked private quarters we find the reason for the eventual collapse of this vault. Inside one of the dilapidated private quarters we find a private terminal that was owned by R. Gutierrez. We learn that, as is their custom, Vault Tech's motives for this vault are as Machiavellian as ever. Gutierrez was actually an agent for Vault Tech, who lived in the vault pretending to be a recovering addict like all of the others. Not even the Overseer knew that he was actually an agent for Vault Tech. He is given strict instructions to follow the Vault Tech rehabilitation program with all of the other inhabitants. He's been given his own backstory that he has rehearsed, that he knows by memory no one must find out his true purpose. We learn that vault Tech instructs him to shift his objective after five years. Five years exactly corresponds with 2082, the date we found for the final meeting notes in the Overseer's Terminal. After five years, Gutierrez unlocked a hidden storage compartment filled to the brim with chems. Gutierrez is only supposed to open the hidden compartment, allowing the vault residents to discover the stash of chems on their own. Once discovered, Gutierrez is supposed to document what happens next. Gutierrez leaves a private entry inside the terminal and says that the rehabilitation program was working. The program did help every subject in the vault deal with the symptoms of withdrawal and cope with their new lives inside the vault. This proved the first part of their theory, which is that if given no other alternative, human beings can recover from even the deepest of addictions. The second experiment is to see what the introduction of new addictive stimuli will do to the social order that had been created over the previous five years. Outside his room, just down the hallway, we find the hidden compartment. Deep in the wall is a shelving unit filled with chems, booze, and other addictive stimuli. Most of it seems to have already been pilfered and used. There are only a few pieces left in this hidden compartment, but the floor is littered with Vault 95 resident skeletons. It seems that the answer to their second experiment was chaos. 
introducing chems into this fragile community dashed it to pieces. It destroyed that feeling of family that they had built up over the past five years. Brother turned against brother as they scrambled for chems and booze, and it led to deaths. In the very back of the residential area, close to where we find the big gun's bobblehead, yes. we find the private terminal belonging to vault dweller J. Scott. His first log entry was right after the stash of chems had been discovered. He's heartbroken. He was grateful for the new chance at life that vault Tech had given them, and he loved the new family that had formed within this vault. He thought that he could live the rest of his life here, free from addiction, but the discovery of the chems changed everything. In Log 2, we learn exactly how much chems vault Tech had hidden away. Scott describes it as a lifetime's worth of chems and booze, laid out, as he puts it, like a freaking department store window display. Some members of the vault cracked right away and grabbed as much as they could. There was fighting. Scott didn't want to lose the family that he had built up over the past five years, and so he hid. He locked himself in his room, but even now, while he sits at his terminal, writing log entry number two, he still hears gunshots. He doesn't want to give up what they built here, but how can they recover after killing each other? In log three, we see Scott's willpower start to crumble. It's taking every ounce of my willpower to stay here locked in my room, he says. I thought I was over the stuff. I never thought I would see it again. I didn't think it had power over me. But he thought wrong, because in log number four, we learn that he breaks. There's no reason for me to stay sober anymore, he says. It's just as messed up down here in the vault as it is up there above ground. And he needs something to cope. In his final sentence, he says, I don't care about the program. I'm going out to be with my friends. I hope somebody is left. Somebody was left, and that somebody killed him. We find what is very likely Jay Scott's body inside his room, a crumpled skeleton tucked in the corner. As we all know, things did not go according to plan for vault Tech. Not only did the nuclear apocalypse completely destroy the company, making all of their experiments futile, but everyone in this vault, from the overseer to Gutierrez himself, met the same fate. The recovering addicts scrambled for all of the chems and booze in the hidden compartment. They devoured a lifetime's worth in just a short period of time. Many residents retreated to their own private rooms with their personal stashes of chems, but when they ran out, they ventured out to find more, and as the stockpile dwindled, they turned on each other. They turned on their own adoptive family members and slew each other for just one more high. Gutierrez was likely killed, meaning that he didn't last long enough to record the results of this second experiment, but the evidence is scattered around the vault for us all to see. Skeletons with bony hands, still clasping Jet, still clasping Psycho, and some of which are at each other's throats. Vault 95 is a great place to loot for resources. You find an abundance of steel, ceramic, and aluminum. Coffee cups, coffee pitchers, aluminum, and tin cans are scattered throughout the vault. Vault 95 also presents us a lore problem because, as we learned in a previous video, Jet was actually created by a boy genius in Fallout 2. And yet, if you go to the Vault Tech Regional HQ, you find a terminal that confirms that Vault Tech supplied Vault 95 with a huge shipment of Jet, which could never have happened if the chem was invented after the bombs dropped. I suppose we could assume that the boy genius from Fallout 2 was lying, that he didn't invent Jet. Maybe he just reinvented it, deconstructing the recipe from Jet that he previously found. We learn from the blueprints found in the Overseer's office that Vault 95 was large enough to house 72 dwellers. I didn't count all of the skeletons found around, but there are so many skeletons in here that I imagine it's close to that number. How long would it take for 72 people to consume a lifetime's worth of chems? Apparently, not long. So what can we learn about mankind from this event? Well, it's a pretty dark story, and it's a troubling one. We'd like to think that sicknesses can be cured, that addictions can be cured. I would like to think so. But here we find a community that, for all intents and purposes, was cured of their addictions. But the moment that those chems were reintroduced, a segment of that population fell immediately. Were they ever truly cured? 
Is the absence of temptation a true cure? Does one's personality really change? Has one defeated his or her demons just because he no longer has access to those demons anymore? Is deprivation really the best way to change a behavior? If this story reflects humanity, then I would say no. Being deprived of chems didn't change their addictive personalities. It kept them hidden, only to emerge later when those temptations re-emerged. I think that the moral of this story, then, is that true change is almost a magical thing. It can't really be quantified. It can't really be taught or programmed. It's something that happens to a human being when the time is right for that person. Maybe it's after years of positive encouragement from friends and family. Maybe it only happens after years of exposure to challenging art that causes them to think about things they didn't think about before. Books, movies, television, and games. Until one day, something clicks into place and that person wants to change. That person has the desire and the motivation and the earnestness to change. Only then will a person reject his or her demons even when surrounded by them, even when they are abundant. Can that moment be packaged in a nice pill and shipped out to cure addictions? In Fallout 4, sure. Strap them in a chair. Inject needles into their neck and you're good to go. But in real life, no. I think it takes a lifetime of experience a lifetime of education, and a lifetime of support from people who love you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story to Vault 95, another dark chapter in the history of vault Tech and their Machiavellian experimentation on innocent people. Sadly, unlike with the happy story of Vault 81, in this case, there were no survivors. But what are your thoughts on Vault 95? Does the whole jet thing bother you? If not, why not? Let me know, I'd love to hear your opinions. Do you think it's worth it to take Kate here to get her off of her addiction? Or would you prefer that she doesn't disapprove of you using Jet and other chems as you travel with her around the wasteland? Let me know in the comments below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my new videos, so your best bet at me making a video just for you is to leave your request below. If you'd like to join the Oxhorn community on Discord, click on my invitation link in the description of this video. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private chat room in my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But as always, more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.